My name is Holly Bellabono. I am the executive director at ASMV, which is however you want to say it. There's adult and continuing education. There's advancing career education on Martha's Vineyard. There's accessible community education, whatever you want the letters to stand for. It's basically saying that we are a service provider, a nonprofit here on Martha's Vineyard, serving our community with a uh, educational opportunities that otherwise would not exist here. And very happy to do it for all ages. We're working with adolescents all the way up through elders and uh, really focusing also on professionals and helping people get the business skills and the professional credentials that they need in order to make a living here. Uh, so it's a really wonderful organization and this is a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. So thank you if you've made a donation. Um, if not, I um, encourage you to consider uh, making a donation and uh, at the end, I'll put up the slide that has the link for our donation button. We are super thrilled uh, to begin our one day university on social justice today. Uh, we have six guest lecturers throughout the course of the day, all on social and racial justice. And I am really pleased to launch off and to kick off our entire day with Nancy Hoffman. Um, Nancy is joining us. Um, uh, she works with um, Jobs for the Future and she's gonna tell us more about that. She's also our board member, one of our wonderful board members and uh, has been really wonderful to work with, particularly as we get more involved with the high school and with young adults and with um, people who are entering the career field and um, need some extra resources or guidance. Um, Nancy's been wonderful in helping us um, map forward uh, our, our path in that direction. So I am thrilled to have you here today, Nancy, and I'm looking forward to our talk. Um, if people in the audience have questions, please um, fill out the chat, uh, the little chat box at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna be monitoring that throughout the talk. And Nancy has said, you know, that if, if we get questions, we'll interrupt and just make it very informal so it's more of a conversation as we go along. Um, if you would, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your career. Okay, <clears throat> so noticing that there's a good bit of gray hair on the screen. <laughs> I, and therefore, uh, people who are who are used to long stories about lives, I will make this relatively short, but um, I am 78 years old and I consider myself a historical artifact. Uh, <laughs> I come from a family uh, that didn't use the term social justice, but was certainly involved in social justice activities. Uh, when I was a child, my mother was the person who organized uh, peace marches and anti-nuclear uh, marches at, at our, at our uh, New Jersey high school. <clears throat> and I grew up in a family where there was lots of um, loud discussion about politics uh, over dinner with lots of people. <clears throat> but um, to really just give you a short uh, idea of what I, what I mean by a historical artifact, I started college in 1960. It was a quiet-ish time, but things were beginning to percolate, uh, as those of you know who were around then. And um, <clears throat> I transferred from Brandeis to UC Berkeley in 1962 and got there just as the what were called the auto row sit-ins were going on. It may feel very familiar to you. It was a sit-in to ask that there or demand that there be more um, black uh, hires in the auto industry, uh, the auto showrooms in San Francisco. From there, uh, we, we moved to the free speech movement and to the Black Panthers and uh, the White Panthers and a, a, a lot of activity um, and uprisings around uh, social justice. Uh, I was particularly involved in something way back then called Friends of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We were raising money in the Bay Area for uh, young people who had gone south to register voters and work on social justice issues. And then in, um, and I was a, an undergraduate, but when I was a graduate student in 1965 um, in comparative literature, doing a lot of studies of the Renaissance, so not exactly relevant to becoming a community organizer, I went to Mississippi um, with my then husband um, 
to uh, work in a small town called Batesville, which is about an hour south of Memphis. And it was a, one of those uh, very common stories for young white women in that period. Um, we gathered in New, New Orleans. Um, we went to Jackson, Mississippi in an integrated car, which was quite dangerous. Um, we were all arrested um, in a um, parading without, for parading without a permit. Uh, the white women who were, uh, who were many were all put in the local uh, jail in Jackson for about two weeks. There were about 10 of us in a cell for two. And we were in the luxury accommodations. They put the black women, the, the black men, um, and the white men all in a stock, an outdoor stockade. Um, my parents, of course, uh, called uh, Teddy Kennedy and <laughs> prevailed upon him to get us out. I think I probably still have some kind of a record. But uh, that, that, uh, that thread in my life, to particularly working around issues of, of uh, racial equity, really had a big impact on everything else that I've done. So uh, fast forward, um, I got my first academic job at UC Santa Barbara in 1969-70. And the campus went from a place where my students would show up in bathing suits and put their surf surfboards outside the classroom um, to a place that was in a complete uproar. This was the Cambodia invasion year. And, um, Students burned the Bank of America. They burned a, uh, a National Guard um, arsenal. Campus was in a total uproar and went from being this quiet kind of conservative right-wing place to being a hotbed of, of activism. Um, and so I was very involved with the students there. And <laughs> this may make you laugh. Um, a group of young women students came to me and said, we want to have a course about women. And I said, women? Why would you want to have a course about women? I was, you know, I was the, the, the person who was hanging out with all the male organizers. Um, but I said, okay, let's give it a try. I was the only young woman professor at all with a very short skirt, if I remember, and fishnet stockings, if you remember those, um, and boots. Uh, <laughs> so I said, okay, you come to my house Sunday mornings and we'll have breakfast and then we'll go to the library and look up women in the card catalog. I had a PhD in English, but uh, the only writers we were allowed to read or to uh, write a dissertation on were Jane Austen, maybe the Brontes, uh, that was about it. Um, so we read a bunch of novels and the first course I taught during all of this turmoil in Santa Barbara was called Women and Madness because what we found were lots of novels, mainly written in the 50s, about uh, women who had gone mad, partly because uh, the feminine mystique had not come out yet and many women were, were, were suffering at home or working in jobs in which they really had no voice and, and, and very little agency. So uh, I will skip the, the rest of the story. I ended up going to Portland, Oregon, starting a women's studies program there. Oh, and Santa Barbara, I probably had the first uh, conference of women's studies on my front lawn. It was a West Coast conference with about 100 people, as I recall, outside in an avocado orchard. So, <laughs> um, so then I, I, uh, I began to teach women's studies and slowly um, my career changed from uh, English Renaissance to women's studies, although uh, I was in Oregon for a couple of years and then moved to MIT, um, where I uh, was hired as a Renaissance teacher. And there, um, as Beth Smith will remember, <laughs> who's an old friend from way back, UMass Boston was starting something called the College of Public and Community Service. And our goal, I feel like I'm telling my grandchildren, but much more attentive than they are, an audience, a sort of long bedtime story here, but it will soon come to an end. Um, they were starting a college for adults, and it was one of about three such colleges started in the United States. If you can think back, there were tons of women at that point who were impacted by the women's movement, getting divorced, doing community organizing, 
and many of them had not had a college education. So our goal was to credential all the poor people in Boston by assessing their prior learning and giving them credit for what they had already learned. Um, and so that was a, a, a very exciting time. Um, from, from there, uh, I had an academic career a couple of years in Washington, DC in the Carter administration, uh, became a, a dean at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, moved to Philadelphia, <laughs> um, continued to work on activist things, uh, even though I was a, a faculty member. Um, in Philadelphia, one, we're, we're getting close to the, the end of my peripatetic career. In Philadelphia, uh, somehow I think I was bad, either bad or good karma. The day I started my job, um, the whole university went on strike. And I had all the, I was running the honors program and I had all these students who didn't know what to do. So I looked out the window and saw a big high school down the street. And I said, okay, let's go down there and see if we can help out. And uh, that really started me on a serious career change from women's studies to working with, with urban schools. Um, I actually taught a course where students called working in urban schools. I then moved on to Brown and uh, worked for the president for a bit. And then uh, in the education department, did a lot more work um, around urban schooling. The, and we didn't talk about career pathways at that point. We talked about um, getting students access to college. The fields evolved substantially since then. Um, if you think about the issues that you read in the newspaper about who goes to, to college. And I would say over the first decade of the 2000s, we were focused more still on helping poor people, young people without many assets and without uh, many of them first generation. We we're focused on helping them uh, get into college, do the requirements and get in. Around about the middle of the, uh, around 20, uh, the, the middle of the first uh, decade of the 2000s, we began to see that access wasn't providing, wasn't getting us to success. And you may be surprised to know it's only still about 35% of the adult population that have a post-secondary degree. So back then it was fewer, and it's still a very small proportion of the 40% of people who are in the lowest asset group, which is a large proportion of the US. Only about 11% of those people actually complete a post-secondary degree. So there was a big, big challenge. And um, I, at, at that time, left Brown and went to work for JFF which was then a small organization of about 20 people um, located in Boston. And uh, we, I went there because the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which was just getting started um, as a big philanthropic entity, got the idea from uh, some innovative schools that existed that they were going to start a set of schools for low-income young people with a focus on students of color that rather than remediating students who were behind were, was going to accelerate them and actually have them start college while in high school and provide up to two years of college that would uh, result in, a, in an associate's degree. So uh, JFF at that time didn't have anyone who knew post-secondary education. So um, I'm going to stop for a second. Would my sweet husband there please turn off your video so I don't have to watch you fiddling with your whole screen? <laughs> um, he probably can't even hear me. Um, so in any case, um, <clears throat> Bob, what I asked was, would you turn off your screen, your video, please? <laughs> OK, got a smile. Uh, um, so. Um, so I came to JFF really to start this early college high school initiative. And the rest is a long history that went from starting about 70 schools all over the country in about uh, in a couple of years to today when um, 
the notion that high school students could start taking college courses in high school and that that would actually work as a way of connecting young people to post-secondary education earlier and getting them more likely to complete. That was a, a new idea then, and we've been working on that for uh, really about uh, almost two decades now with some very good results. Um, last thing I'll say here is that um, <clears throat> we kept very close data on the first um, hundred schools and they were, they tend to be around the periphery of the United States where the lowest income uh, families live and where the school systems were weakest. And our results after uh, collecting data for a number of years, and this still is true today, show that about, um, that almost uh, the average student in an early college taking college courses was graduating with about a year of free college. Um, about a third were graduating with a full associate's degree, so ready either to transfer or enter the labor market. And that the boost in achievement is greatest for students of color. So um, if you're going to ask me uh, about the work that I'm proudest of, it's really that work. And uh, even though college teaching, which I did for many, many years was wonderfully exciting and I'm still in touch with many of the young people who've gone on to terrific careers. Having impact on systems change is one of the most important things that the nonprofit world can really accomplish. So I will stop there. If anyone wants to ask questions, I can't see the chat, but I'm happy to. Um, Connie just wrote saying that she has a, her hand up, a question for you. Yeah. But she did not write the question. So Connie, if you <laughs> want to unmute yourself and ask your question, feel free. It's not a question, it's a little reminder. I think Nancy <laughs> should tell us what the name of her first book was. It had a very prophetic title. Oh, you mean Women's True Profession? Women's True Profession. Oh, that wasn't my first book. My first book was Sorry. Spencer's Pastorals. <laughs> it was a book on the Renaissance lyric published by Johns Hopkins Press. And I think probably only my mother and my dissertation director read it. <laughs> so Connie and I have known each other, I don't know, it's more than 50 years. Uh, so she, I no more secrets, please, Connie. No, but that was a... a a book that really explored um, the profession, historically, the profession of, of teaching for women. And as many of you, I'm sure, know, teaching was really one of the few ways with being a nurse uh, that allowed women to travel, to have some agency, to have a public platform because you could stand up in a classroom and hold people's attention. And uh, it's still very much a women's profession with the good and the bad of that, which we could go into at some later point. Thank you. So Nancy, I know that you have some slides about jobs for the future. Um, it's a really important organization. And if, do you want to so, show those slides? Yeah, if I can do this. Okay. We practiced the screen share. So let's see if I can do it again. Okay. Okay, let me just go to a different view. Uh, okay, I think everybody can see. Yes, great. Okay. So um, we one of the one of the goals of this session, um, even though I can see that most of you are not about to start your first career in a nonprofit, although I'm looking at Rachel from ACE, so she's she's the target audience for some of this, which is uh, we really wanted to talk a bit about what it's like to work in a nonprofit, um, what the good preparation is, because there's so many young people, particularly now with the racial uprisings that we've had, the huge economic disparities unveiled by the pandemic um, and all the time that people have had at home to, to think about their lives and 
how to make them purposeful. It's a time when many young people, I, I'm sure, are wanting to think about how you work in a social justice organization. So I'm gonna just go through a few slides here about JFF. As I said, we're located in Boston, but we, from the 20 people that were there um, when I joined in 2001, there are now about 160 of us. And we have an office in DC, a small policy office, an office in Oakland, California, a small office in Denver, and lots of remote employees. And uh, <clears throat> the fact that we have an office in Boston is great, but I haven't been there since March and neither has anyone else. So like many organizations, we're really functioning remotely. Um, what I will say is this organization is not a typical nonprofit. We started out as one, but we started out 35 years ago, 37 years ago as Jobs for Connecticut's Future. Um, founded by uh, Hillary Pennington, who's now a vice president, executive vice president at the Ford Foundation. And we grew and grew. That's not the best thing always, or the only thing for a nonprofit, but for JFF, uh, our national footprint has grown and it's really been a good journey. So I'm gonna just show you a little bit of how we talk about ourselves. Um, so as you can see here, um, we're going to talk a little bit about COVID's impact on the economy, but even before that, the, the data um, was, were, were really startling. Um, so you can see less than 14% of Lowell low students who attended college completed their studies and graduated a little more than the 11% that I talked about earlier. Um, 15% of US workers live below the federal poverty line. We don't use the federal policy line. We use something that MIT uses, which is called the living wage calculator. And in most cases, it's the, a living wage is substantially above the poverty line. Uh, just think of trying to live in Martha's Vineyard or Boston on under 20,000 or $25,000 a year. So that's what JFF is all about. It's about economic mobility. And I don't think I have to connect economic mobility with social justice, but many of the issues, of course, that cause the, the, the stasis that we have, or even the downward economic mobility have to do with uh, injustices and inequalities in the systems that, uh, <laughs> that we have to support us. <clears throat> So this is just a little bit about what's happened with COVID. Um, one of my favorite college presidents uh, has just, who, uh, this is Bunker Hill Community College, just wrote a long piece. She was giving a, a lecture about COVID and she started with the metaphor that it was like a lightning bolt that shed light on every crack in the US, uh, both physical infrastructure and uh, metaphorical one. So, what we see is that um, as of August, students from families with incomes under $75,000 canceled, two times as likely to cancel college plans. And we see enrollments down substantially. ACE is trying to step in there with some short-term program certifications that get people back into the labor market quickly. But the low-income people are really in crisis at this point. And generally in economic downturns, people go to colleges, community colleges are flooded. They aren't right now because there's too much going on among families with illness, being essential workers, um, the psychological and uncertainty that is causing huge stress. So we see a real decline in college going. <clears throat> um, um, Nancy? Yeah. Just real quick, um, Susan P is asking if we, if uh, you could per, please refer um, us to any methods or sites that you know of that cater to funding activists, nonprofits, social justice. <laughs> um, what ways to finance and what ways to financially support support these efforts? Okay. Maybe that's some you know you could send no, a no, list I later, actually, or you have no. something. I, I wrote a bunch of questions for Holly and one of them was about challenges and a big challenge as Holly will tell you, and many of you probably know from your own nonprofit connections. 
uh, this is a raising money for small nonprofits is very difficult, not quite the same for large ones. And at this moment, it's even more difficult because um, there, people don't have the discretionary money that they had. And they are generally, if they're giving, uh, as we have, um, giving to, uh, now, now it's, it's somewhat over, but giving to political uh, campaigns and candidates. And it's a very difficult time for fundraising. I will say something about that. <clears throat> I'll just say a couple more things about JFF. You can read this, so I won't talk about that. Um, and I will just say one thing about where we are. JFF used to, uh, for many years, really support major systems change. And we see that as happening uh, really in, the, at, among, in um, economic regions. We do have a federal role. We do see a re federal role in workforce and education, but it's relatively light touch. And it's states and regions where the grassroots work really goes on. But in 2018, we, we launched JFF Labs, which is really uh, outside of the systems, the large systems that exist for education and workforce, and really is, is, a, is where the startup world um, and the new economy world is putting its energy in developing generally tech-based solutions to today's problems. Um, probably like you, I'm critical of some of these where uh, very well-educated young people want to make money as well as have social impact. Uh, uh, so do, do good while doing well. Uh, but some of those uh, platforms are going to infuse new energy into old systems. And we hope that one of the positive things from COVID is that some of these um, tech platforms will actually stay to make practices and, and policies more efficient and accessible to more people. I mean, one sort of cliche and case in point is uh, you could be in China or uh, Afghanistan, and if you had internet, you could be tuning into this wonderful uh, day on social justice. <clears throat> so going a little long. So this is simply the way we talk about our, our work. Um, smaller organizations generally are more at the in, in, uh, invention and grassroots um, program design. We do a, a lot of policy work and um, we also will take innovations that we develop or others develop and work on scaling them. That means bringing them to other places um, and adapting them for other uh, environments. So um, I'm gonna just quick go through these. This just tells you, and I'm happy to make these slides available if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> so this is about how we, how we do our work, impact people, places, and systems. Um, I've been driving around uh, Martha's Vineyard where I am. And there are all these signs up that say, only you and I can end racism. Well, I'm only halfway there on that. What we really need to do is deal with uh, systems of injustice or some systemic uh, racism or systemic injustice. And that can seem daunting. It really isn't. Um, what we're working to do, for example, on a very small scale is change the, the system here in Martha's Vineyard of launching young people from school into careers. Uh, let's see, um, we help people advance. So you can see where we do a lot of work with Google that is now providing a free IT certification through um, uh, edX as well as through a bunch of, of community colleges, several hundred community colleges. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, we really focus on regional economies. So I will, um, just do the give you a quick look at the last slide because this is where I really work the most, um, which is redesigning education systems and um, and really bringing together two pieces of of government and of systems that have been unfortunately disconnected, and that is the workforce system and the education system. So most states have a Department of Labor and a Department of Education. And unfortunately, they don't see 
that people go to school to get a career and therefore education and workforce or education and labor need to be integrated. So when we say integrated work and learning pathways, um, you know, we, when, when kids are six or seven, we take them to see the bakery. We ask Rachel to come in and talk about her job at ACE. We ask uh, Beth to come in and talk about what it's like to run a philanthropy, which Beth Smith did um, in Boston for many years. And then that all disappears. And by middle school, kids are not learning much about careers. And by high school, relatively little unless they're in a vocational program. And so we, what we've been doing at JFF and now is really a national movement is attempting to once more bring together work and learning and to start with the premise that <clears throat> most people need a post-secondary credential of some kind and that almost every young person goes to college to get a career. So to say college is the end point makes very little sense, especially in this economy. We, uh, my husband and I and a whole crew about 12 years ago started something called the Pathways to Prosperity Network. And that's the work in some ways that's, uh, we're, we're bringing on a small scale to Martha's Vineyard High School, helping young people learn about careers much earlier and connect with post-secondary programs and apprenticeships much earlier on. So this is a few of our funders. Uh, this is not the answer to, to uh, Susan's question because we raise about $60 million a year, and that's a, a pretty large sized nonprofit. Um, but I can also talk a little bit about the challenges of, of being um, philanthropy and government funded. And I'm going to, you can see our operating budget. That's 53 million, it's bigger now. Um, and we work across all 50 states. Our Pathways Network is in about 16 states and a number of, of cities. And um, this is just, this is, um, if you wanna know what foundations want, they wanna see numbers like this that say, uh, we are having impact and the impact can't be um, more kids feel good about themselves. It has to be how many participated, what the outcomes were. Um, and so, that's the hardest part of, the, of this work with philanthropy, which is, <laughs> you can see a number of these are really about how many and not with what quality and with what outcome, because that's very, very difficult data to come by. But we do pretty well on that score. And this is really about our, our footprint nationally. So I will unshare my screen if I can. Yep, good. Um, questions, comments at this point? Yeah, go ahead. Really quick, um, Joanne wants to know if JFF has considered working in Puerto Rico. <laughs> well, in the middle of this call today, um, we are having the probably third or fourth um, calls with the American Federation of Teachers um, and have been, it will be, the call will be conducted in Spanish and we're discussing with them a potential engagement to provide um, work workplace experiences for uh, young people in Puerto Rico and uh, engage more employers in the education system. So whoever asked that question, um, <laughs> thank you. So it's Joanne, hi. Um, stay tuned, I'd be happy to tell you more. This call has been disrupted multiple times. And now the, our key person who actually is an old friend of ours is on the Biden uh, education transition team. So this may be del delayed a little more, but in this case for good reasons. Um, but Puerto Rico is a very tough place to work yes. these days. And uh, you could tell me, uh, Joanne, why, that, why you asked? Well, we lived there for six years. My husband ran the Institute of Neurobiology mm -hmm. and we spent a lot of time with the AAUW and the Rotary Club working with young people, letting them know that they have opportunity. Mm -hmm. Many of the young people, I worked in a democratic school and many of the young people felt like there was no future. 
and they need to know there is a future. And the, um, the University of Puerto Rico has tried to start these kinds of things, but again, you know, finances, plus there's the bureaucracy. I mean, it's not, as you say, it's not an easy place to work. Right, right. Lovely people. We've had some bright kids come here. Um, we want them to go back. Uh, and then, you know, seed the uh, community there. So I think, you know, it's something to really think about. They're U.S. citizens. And, and they may, they, they may actually, uh, they may actually become a state at some point. If they well, don't. That, that's a whole, <laughs> um, that's a whole conference. Yes. Um, but, yeah. but, but they are U.S. citizens. <laughs> they can come here for education, but then they need to feel that they can go back and is there industry there? My husband was helping to look at the idea of science and yeah. how science can be the engine that promotes um, industry in Puerto Rico. Great. So, well, thank you so much for- Keep that in mind, Nancy. <laughs> okay. Um, Nancy, I, ha I had a question related to JFF's education work. Do you infuse at all so-called civics civics education you know education about about, vote, about <laughs> what it means to be power yeah it's a really good question beth i mean one of the things that's hard for people to get their heads around with an organization like jff is um, we are an intermediary which means that we don't actually get into classrooms or work directly with teachers very often and so um, we influence curriculum sometimes, but not even that. An intermediary, the role that, that ACE is playing in Martha's Vineyard is rather, you know, it's a small version of what we do, which is that we link in education, schools, regional economic development organizations, employers, and uh, the state mechanisms. So uh, what I would say is the answer is really no, not directly. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge need and, and issue. <laughs> and there are wonderful people, particularly at Tufts that I know working on civic education, um, but we, we, that's not something that we've done directly. Right, yeah, um, I mean, I think there's a, a lot more focus on it. I think with COVID, you know, coming at the same time and the educational system being so disrupted, <clears throat> I think it's probably been hard to make progress. But I also wanted to comment on something in your long career, <laughs> which I had probably knew and forgotten. But when you mentioned being in Mississippi yeah. um, during the civil rights movement and going to Jackson, we were, I was there with my husband um, maybe two years ago <clears throat> doing a civil rights trip. And so sometimes change takes a long time. So you know the flag. In Mississippi, we all read finally changed yeah. this year. And that has been something that certain people in Mississippi have been working on for a long time, activists. Yeah. And I think it, it just shows the importance of activism when you can't necessarily know, right? right. How things well, obviously, lots of important things happened since you were in Mississippi. So I don't, I don't mean to minimize that. Yeah. But other things, boy, they take a long time. Yeah. So that was a that's nice a very thing. Hard, that's a very hard lesson for the young people we hire at JFF to understand is that change, incremental change is really mostly where we are. And it happens slowly and it's two steps forward and one step backward. I want to, I'm going to, I realize we're almost out of time. So I will just, I want to just say a couple of quick things about several topics I missed. How much time do we have, Holly? Um, about nine minutes. And I was hoping <laughs> that you could also address um, uh, the equity. You, and, you yeah. mentioned before we started uh, the idea of taking people's um, credentials off their names on <laughs> different things and, and other items like that. I think that's an interesting shift in systems yeah. Yeah. that I'd like you to address. Yeah, sure. So, um, like many nonprofits, we are we we have always been very careful to focus on uh, racial justice issues, um, but it's not an easy road to hoe. And uh, our leadership for a long time was largely white. Now we have three VPs of of color who are in charge of of programs. Really, I actually hired 
all of them many years ago, and they've kind of grown up and become national leaders in the organization. Um, but we are doing lots of internal work, as many nonprofits are at this point, ab about how to ensure that all voices are heard, how to respect uh, people's backgrounds, how to manage power relationships. And one of the biggest things that's kind of going on across the startup world and in the nonprofit world is uh, a move toward competency-based hiring. One of the things that has really um, kept low-income people out of the labor market and out of good jobs is that employers saw for a long time that the bachelor's degree was a signal of at least completion and where you went to school, a signal of generally your, your class background. Um, as all of you, I'm sure, know, the, the high-end firms re uh, recruit from a very small number of organizations. So what, what, what triggered Holly's interest this morning was she had my picture up and it said Nancy Hoffman PhD. And I said, I never use PhD. And she said, why? With a little look of surprise. And I never have wanted to use it just because it doesn't really matter much to me. Um, uh, having a, a PhD in Renaissance literature is not particularly relevant other than I can write and read. Um, but JFF has taken all of our credentials off our uh, bios and we're seeing quite a lot of this now, which is really what we call competency-based hiring and a move to competency-based assessments so that we're not always looking at the degree, but what uh, the job applicant knows and is able to do. We've been working on this off and on since the 1960s as competency-based uh, kinds of assessment. It's never been uh, really fine-tuned to the extent that we would like it to be. But um, if you think about the things that you know how to do well uh, with your hands, you can prove that you can do them by somebody watching. And it's much harder to take that and translate that into uh, showing what you can do in, that, that isn't uh, with your hands, but that is leading a team or showing empathy or um, learning how to uh, code switch in, when you're in a, a new situations. So that's just a small, a small example. Um, I would say right now, though, like many nonprofits, we're focused on uh, particularly uh, people of color. We've started our, one of our senior um, black leaders is now devoting his entire uh, work time to writing about and speaking about issues for black people because in a sense, we feel uh, not that all lives don't matter, but that if we could open doors and to education and mainly to good jobs for more black Americans, other doors would open for other populations and communities of color. And that's really what we're, we're all about. So the fin final thing I'd say, which, was, uh, which I was gonna spend more time on is about philanthropy. Um, as all of you who, who will know who raise money, it's a tough deal. Um, Beth ran a small foundation in Boston for many years and uh, was on the funder side and one of, was one of the very uh, well-regarded sympathetic funders, but not, you kind of lose sight if you're a funder of what it's really like to do the work. Um, the, I don't know what prompted the, the question. I think it was from Susan, whether it was about small organizations or large ones. I would say once you're established as a you know, 50 to 100 person organization, it becomes a bit, a bit easier. The other thing is that um, I would say that a single purpose, built for purpose organizations are often the ones that are easy to raise money for initially and hard to sustain. And people have always complained that they don't know what JFF does. And that's because we add and subtract and change and where you can't go home and say to your, you know, your family, JFF is only about X. But I think it's given us the opportunity to move and change with the times to be responsive as well as, as cutting edge. And that's just a, a piece of wisdom I've learned over uh, having to write tons of proposals over many, many years. I think we write about 150 proposals a year and have about a three quarters uh, success rate at this point. 
and um, we are working more with corporate philanthropy now. That's a whole change. We used to have a lot more government money that's gone away and the big foundations do continue to fund us. We have almost no private donors. So that's probably my time, Holly. Yeah, we've got, we've got maybe a couple of minutes if anyone has a, a last question or comment, feel free to unmute yourself and jump right in. Beth, do you have any wisdom about raising money for small foundations since you ran Hyams for how many years? <clears throat> I, oh my gosh, more than I can count for 28 years. And, and what was your, um, how much money did you give out a year? Well, we, we gave out maybe five or six million a year, but it, yeah. and it was all local. And we funded a lot of, really by the time I left, a lot of justice work that was focused on organizing and policy change. Yeah. Not, we didn't fund a lot of direct services. So it's almost like a whole separate conversation and discussion, which I'd be happy to try to have. I have been out of philanthropy now for five, four years, but I've tried to stay in touch with it. And in terms of smaller organizations that are very social justice oriented, there <laughs> tends to be a very small number of funders yeah. who fund that kind of thing. <clears throat> and they're pretty well known. Um, and so, and it's not hard to, to find out about them. With this focus now on racial justice, I see more funders getting into funding that type of thing. So there may be opportunities um, for smaller organizations to tap into some of those resources. Yeah. Um, and again, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, We, we may come back to you time. and ask you for some help. And I will say, because she's probably too modest to say so, the next small organization that's a social justice organization is run by her son, Tom, um, with whom my son went to nursery school. <laughs> right. And that is a really unusual, very, very special kind of organization. No, both Tom and I see Lanita, Lanita has, has joined. Yeah. yeah, both Tom and, and Lidita have experience with this. And as Nancy said, it is hard, hard, hard work. Dealing with funders is not easy and it's <laughs> on the whole easy. not fun. <laughs> I, and I was going to say some things about venture philanthropy, which is where this field is going. Social impact philanthropy is much more like business. Not only will they be very uh, much in your, in your email box, but they will be on your board and in your activities. And that's just the world these days. Yeah. We have to be strong and uh, <laughs> keep our values strong and push back when we need to, but also take their money and do good things with it. So I think I will end on that note. Well, thank you, Nancy. That was um, a really interesting and inspiring look at not only your life, which is hysterical, and I love it, it was wonderful to hear about your, your history, but also jobs for the future and how, um, you know, these equity systems are changing. And, yeah. um, and we have a ton, a ton of resources on our website. Everything is free. If you want to email me, um, Holly can provide my email. I do, I work part time now, and I do a lot of sharing of, of resources with people who are interested. So. Thank you. So, um, we are going to take a short break and we're coming back at 11 o'clock with Tom Smith and Lanita Reason for um, Tom is with Justice at Work in Boston and Lanita is with Brazilian Worker Center in Boston. And the topic of their talk is immigrant rights and dignity for all on the job. So that's gonna begin at 11 o'clock. It's the same link. You can just leave your screen open and we'll just hop right back on at 11. Uh, and I look forward to moving to our next speaker soon. So thank you all for joining us and thank you, Nancy. Thank you.